Church. This is Pastor Alejandro Arias, and it's such a blessing to come live this Pentecost Sunday. All the way from Brisbane, I pray that all of you are having a blessed Sunday and that the Lord is doing amazing things in your life, in your family, and in the church. I am so blessed to speak about the Holy Spirit, the legacy He left for us. And uh, what a great blessing to have the Holy Spirit in our life, in our family, in our church life. I think when we learn to appreciate what the Holy Spirit has done for us and what He continues to do every day, we learn so much about the work of the Holy Spirit, the intimate work of God in our hearts. And I thank God for the Holy Spirit because it's such a great gift to the church. Um, and I'm telling you, the Holy Spirit has come to enrich us, He has come in, uh, to empower us, and He has come to fill us with power. And like that Greek word that I love to um, use when I preach about the Holy Spirit, He has come to fill us with dunamis, with dunamis, with that dynamic power of God. So I am so blessed, I'm so privileged to come live this Sunday morning to share with you all about the legacy that we have. You know, today we're celebrating Pentecost Sunday. More than 2,000 years ago, the Holy Spirit came upon 120 disciples, including the 12 disciples of Jesus Christ, who were gathering, waiting upon God for the gift of the Holy Spirit. As you know, the Holy Spirit had always been involved in the church life, in the world, but he was kind of like hovering around people. He was hovering around the world. He was not really dwelling in the hearts of the people. And it wasn't until the Holy Spirit was fully manifested and fully known when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples and they were baptized with tongues. Like the Bible says, as if there were flames of fire falling off the sky. Isn't that amazing when you read that scripture and you realize what just what happened? What a, an incredible moment. What a historical moment. What a history defining moment when the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit for the first time. Their life, their ministry, even their journey changed completely overnight. When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, they were never the same men, the same disciples. Their life were completely transformed. So today I want to talk about that. I want to celebrate this legacy. What a legacy we have. What a legacy. We have the Holy Spirit. He is not just the third person of the Trinity. He is not just that gift for the church. He is an amazing, an amazing individual. And when you understand that the Holy Spirit is not just a force, a wind, a heat. He's not just uh, some kind of a manifestation or feeling. The Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is God the Spirit. As you know, if you believe in the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So I'm so blessed to teach you today about Pentecost. And my message, the title of my message today is about Acts 29. That's, that's it, Acts 29. And you're probably wondering, hold on a second. The book of Acts does not have 29 chapters. So what are you talking about? Exactly, my friend, the 29th chapter is us. We are the ongoing expression of the miraculous, the supernatural, the power of God working, uh, displaying his power in the earth through the church. We are the ongoing expression of the church in this hour. So I want to talk about that and what that means, what that represents, and how you and I can be a blessing to this broken world with the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit hasn't come upon us just to make us feel good. He, he hasn't filled us with his power just so that we can say, hey, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, or just so that we can feel good, or just so that we can speak in new tongues, or just that, so that we can experience God. The Holy Spirit has been given to us as a gift 
so that we can receive power, so that we can do something with that power. And that is what I want to talk about this morning. What can we do with that power? How can we be a blessing to others? How can we reach the lost? How can we win souls? How can we establish and build the kingdom of God? What is our responsibility through the work of the Holy Spirit in this planet? What are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to continue writing history? Jesus, when he, when he ascended into heaven and he left the disciples with the great commission, he said, go and tell and win the souls, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I mean, he gave them the greatest commission and he passed that to the disciples. Their disciples passed that on to all their disciples and it's reached many, many, many generations. It's an, an, in, basically, it, it has impacted the whole world. It has shaken the nations. And let me tell you something. The Pentecostal church is the fastest growing branch of Christianity in the world. So having said that, we that walk and experience the Holy Spirit, we know what it is to have and carry the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's such a wonderful blessing, such a wonderful gift. And I want to talk about what the Holy Spirit actively is doing in our lives and how, as a church, we need to use these giftings and win the lost and reach people. And this is what the disciples did. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the Bible says that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, so they were teachable, and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give it to anyone who had need. They were very selfless people, not selfish. They were selfless every day. They continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with gladness and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. So I want to talk about some qualities of uh, you know, walking with the Holy Spirit, being a, an ongoing expression of that church that is, is meant to make a difference, being the ongoing expression of a church that carries a part of the Holy Spirit, you know, being that church that is could do, that is meant to 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 make history, that is meant to 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 change history, that is meant to to change uh, our community, our neighborhood, our city. We are meant to carry the good news. We are carriers of His. His presence and if we carry his presence we are carriers of change the power of God changes people the power of God when he comes to a place it changes people well, let me uh, reflect on what happened that day when well, the disciples were together they were praying they were you know waiting upon God can you imagine they had been waiting for weeks and weeks you know Jesus told them go to go up to Jerusalem and wait for the promise and when the Holy Spirit comes upon you then you will know and so the disciples were in a room and if you've been to Israel I have been to Israel I had the privilege of going to Israel two years ago and uh, I can tell you that uh, when they took us to the uh, upper room, it was quite an, a special experience. It was quite a unique experience when we went up the steps into that small room. And I'm thinking, I'm looking around and thinking, wow, they must have been jam packed, you know, just waiting for the promise of God. Imagine 120 people waiting, praying, uh, you know, uh, waiting upon God in a small room. So when they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and mind you, this was not um, far away from the city. This was very close to the temple. And as you know, Jerusalem, old Jerusalem, was a very small city, a very small city in comparison to Melbourne or Brisbane or even the downtown of the greatest cities in the world. Jerusalem was a very small city. And if we compare Jerusalem with today's expectations of a city, Jerusalem would have never, never been categorized as a city, would have been categorized as a town, as a, you know, just a a township it had a big temple you know that was the kind of the landmark of Jerusalem the, the, the temple and people would you know go to Jerusalem they would travel from all over the world and they would come to offer their sacrifice to pay respect to to celebrate their feasts 
you know, because the Jewish had uh, many feasts throughout the year. So one of the feasts that was happening uh, on that around that time, uh, you know, it was the the, the feast of uh, uh, the, you know around that time when Jesus died. You know, when Jesus went to the cross and when and, and when he died and, and when he was raised from the dead, they were celebrating the feast of uh, uh, Passover. And so the, there were many visitors. There were many tourists, if I can call it, if I can say that. There were many people from uh, all over the world, you know, traveling and, 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 and you know, spending time with their family and, and just having a great time and, and visiting their homeland, you know, visiting the motherland. So Jerusalem was a very popular city. It was the epicenter of the Jewish faith and the Jewish religion. And so people, all Jewish people from all over the world would you know, actually flocked Jerusalem around that time. So there were a lot of visitors when this happened. There were a lot of tourists. And so when uh, this uh, folks who are praying fervently and they're, you know, praying in the, in, in, in the power of God and then all of a sudden the Bible describes it as a mighty rushing wind. All of a sudden this mighty rushing wind hits the room and they are all baptized in fire. The Bible says as if tongues of fire, you you know, to, fell from heaven. Look, like, can you imagine that? Can you picture that in the spirit? Can you see like 120 men and women praying and then all of a sudden fire, like tongues of fire falls upon them and they begin to speak in other tongues. And so they were obviously astonished. You know, they didn't know what to do with this experience. They had no idea. Uh, some of the people, the expectators, the ones that were looking from outside, you know, immediately when they're uh, speaking in tongues and they're loud and you get obviously in the context uh, of that era you know the houses uh, they were very tiny and the windows probably were open because it was too hot inside you know the, there was no air conditioning in those days so they had the windows open so then all of a sudden uh, the, the neighbors are hearing a rowdy crowd speaking in other tongues and I'm sure you know in that culture in that context the neighbors would have uh, come out of their houses they would have gathered around that house and they would have been, uh, you know, looking from downstairs and wondering what's going on upstairs. And then uh, Peter, you know, he's filled with the Spirit. He's filled with the power of God. And he is prompted to go to the temple. And then, you know, a crowd swells up. A crowd begins to build up. And there is a great crowd. You know, everyone is wondering what's going on with this, folks. What's going on? Why are they speaking in other tongues? And then the visitors and the tourists heard him speaking in their own tongue. And they're like amazed. They're astonished. They're like, we can't believe that we're hearing uh, this Jewish man who had been born and bred in, in Israel. They're speaking our tongue from the country that we came from. And so they're all amazed. They're astonished. They're in shock. They can't believe it. And Peter goes up to the temple. Now, mind you, I want you to understand that the distance from uh, the upper room to the temple is similar to... It's similar, and I, and I say it because I, I've been to Melbourne. It's, it's probably similar to um, the distance between the train station, you know, the Melbourne train station to the, um, the, the you know, the, the museum, the, uh, one of the big museums. I think it's the Immigration Museum. It's very close to the train station. It's a very short distance. And so imagine that so peter walks over to the temple the crowd is following peter they're all wondering what's going on they're all thinking actually they were under the impression that these men and women were drunk but it was early in the morning it was early in the morning and imagine all these folks speaking in other tongues and and you know praying and rejoicing and and, and, and you know for for an outsider look for an outsider who was looking from the outside an outsider was thinking my goodness they, these guys are crazy they've lost they've lost it they have completely lost it now and so peter when he is, you know, confronted by a big crowd, because at this point the crowd has swollen to 5,000 people or more, and they were all watching Peter, and they were all watching the disciples, and they're all, all curious, and, you know, can you imagine? It was like the talk of, of the moment, like people were talking, and, and they couldn't believe, and so the crowd had swollen, and, and there was a, this big crowd of people wondering what's going on in Jerusalem, and, and then all of a sudden Peter's up 
and he begins to preach. And he started his message with the prophecy that Joel gave to Israel. If you read the, the book of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28, where it says that men, you know, that young men shall see visions, that children shall prophesy, that in the great day when the Holy Spirit would come upon people, that all these manifestations were going to happen. So he begins to preach. His message was amazing. It wasn't so much about how eloquent or how well prepared or how amazing his message came across. No, it was the power of the Holy Spirit. And so when he was preaching, the ears of every Jew, every even every Gentile, everyone who was around that crowd, everyone who was involved in that historical moment, I can just imagine, I can just see, you know, how the Holy Spirit was moving among the crowd. And the ears of these folks were, you know, they were all listening. Their ears were not, not just uh, open in that moment, but their hearts were open. And, and the greatest harvest came into the kingdom that very moment. More than 5,000 people came to the Lord. More than 5,000 people got saved. You know, isn't that awesome? Isn't that awesome? What the Holy Spirit can do in one moment in one moment so at this point they had to become very established very strong in their faith they had become and when i say established i don't mean they had become you know, religious fanatics. No, I mean, they had become solid. They had grown their movement. They had, you know, a discipleship network. They had home groups happening all over Jerusalem. They were meeting in homes. You know, they were praying every day. They were, the, you know, they were actually devoted to the teaching. And they were, they were actually meeting and, and, and breaking bread. And that speaks of communion. That speaks of unity. That speaks of coming together. So the number one thing that I want to teach today, based on verse 42, is they were teachable. When the Holy Spirit is in your life, when you are filled with the power of God, you are teachable. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've, you've learned, no matter how many degrees you have or titles or how much you have aspired in this life or no matter what you've done or your achievements, when you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, there will always be room to learn. There will always be room to be teachable, to sit at the feet of the master and say, hey, Jesus, teach me more. Because one of the greatest sins in this world is the spirit of rebellion and pride. As you know, Satan, Lucifer, he fell from the sky. He basically was kicked out of heaven because of his pride, because of his, of his rebellion. So the, I believe rebellion and pride, they go together. And sometimes rebellion can cause a prideful person to stumble. So I can tell you one thing. These folks were humble. And they were teachable. They would come around. They would sit for hours. You know, the Bible records a, an experience where a man was listening to the apostles' teaching. And, I mean, this happened later on. And if you read the whole book of Acts, you know, Paul was a very zealous preacher. He was a very powerful preacher. He was obviously kind of a long-winded preacher, but he was an amazing preacher. And he preached for hours and hours and hours. And he was filled with the power of God and boldness. And this man who was sitting basically on the verge of the window he was basically sitting you know as you can imagine and so imagine that this house is two-story houses with the windows open there was no restrictions on, on sound limits or nothing like that so i mean you know the neighbors could hear the the apostles were teaching and preaching and i mean it was an, an amazing an amazing movement it was incredible 
And so uh, I can just imagine Paul preaching and teaching to, to the late hours of the evening. And then all of a sudden this man falls asleep. He falls off the window. He hits the ground. He dies. And then Paul goes downstairs. And obviously there's panic. You know, there's confusion. And, and, and they're all, you know, looking at Paul like, what are we going to do? They're all uh, horrified by what just happened. And then Paul prays for this young man. And this man, this man is resurrected. He's raised from the dead <laughs> isn't that awesome i mean god god is the performer of divine and supernatural miracles and through the work of the holy spirit the church this was their reality this was their daily routine this was their daily life they were living walking enjoying the holy spirit 24 7 they had just experienced one of the most historical moments in their life they were filled with the power of God. And so they became very, very teachable. And they were you know, sharing the word and having amazing times, sitting down and, and enjoying fellowship. They were teachable. I remember when I was filled with the Holy Spirit, I was only a young man. I was only eight, actually. And the power of, the, of God came upon me. And uh, I was at a church meeting. And I remember standing there worshiping it. My hands up in the air and then all of a sudden I, I begin to speak another tongue and I fell forward, not backwards, but forward. And the power of God came upon me and hit me like never before. And then I stopped talking in tongues for a long time. That happened as a once-off experience. Then I never used that gift of tongues and it kind of uh, not left me or I don't think that the gift ever left me. But I think it kind of, uh, you know, it was in, in me. But um, it, it was kind of, uh, it was de deactivated, if I can say that. So the Holy Spirit needed to activate that gift down the road. He actually did it. I was uh, praying in my room. I was 11 at this point. And the power of God, you know, and I'm, I'm getting to know the Holy Spirit. I'm building my relationship with God. I'm, I'm really, um, you know, growing in Christ as a young man, as a teenager, you know. Uh, well, I wasn't really a teenager, but as, as a young child, I was really getting to know God. And, and God was, uh, we were spending times together and I was building my prayer life. And I remember I, I started my prayer life just giving God an hour of my day. And then he went from one hour to two hours and then two to three and then four to five. And then I, I used to spend the whole afternoon uh, when I didn't have school. I used to spend the whole afternoon just praying, reciting Bible scriptures and praying and worshiping and reading the Bible. I, I used to love just spending time with God. Uh, in fact, uh, I often tell the story, and it's funny because my dad was so concerned about me. One time, he's like, you know, uh, he he dragged me out of the the room because he was not a believer, and he thought I was, you know, I had completely passed out because he saw me, and I was laying on the ground, I was, you know, flat, you know, just waiting on God, you know, laying flat and not making a movement. I was just waiting on God, you know, having a quiet time, and then he grabs me. He's like, Alejandro, are you okay? And I'm like, Yes, Dad, and he dragged me out of the room and then the next day he brings a, a bottle you know full of vitamins and he's like you need this and you need that it was so concerned about my well-being he thought you know I, I was malnourished or I was not you know I was not being exposed to the sunlight enough and so he was really concerned about my vitamin levels and he decided to buy me all these vitamins he was so concerned about me it was kind of funny you know when I think about it but let me tell you something the Holy Spirit changed my life and I remember that time when the Holy Spirit came into my room and I was alone in, in the house. My, my dad was working. He had a... Um he had a grocery store across the street, so he was working. Uh, my mom was helping him that day. My sister was at school. My brother was uh, playing with some friends. And I was at the house all by myself. And I had been praying for a couple of hours. And I was there waiting on God. And then all of a sudden, I feel this like breeze. Like a wind. And mind you, all the windows were shut. The door was shut. The door, the front door was shut. 
My house is a second story. Our house back in Costa Rica where my parents lived, it was a second story house. And so I was in the second floor and I was, my room was the one actually looking out at the beautiful mountains and the beautiful, you know, the beautiful scenery of Costa Rica. And so I used to uh, just look out the window for hours, just praying and, and spending time with God. And that was my devotional every day, just looking out the window. Uh, and I was like, I, I would never shut the curtains. I would always, you know, have the curtains open because I wanted to pray and look out the window and wait upon God and that day the windows were shot the the, the uh, doors were shot and then I felt this breeze coming from nowhere and it hit me and I was knocked out it was like a lightning bolt hit me and I was knocked out and the power of God came upon me and I began to speak all their tongues what I didn't realize is that somehow my dad managed to get into the house right so he had the key obviously and he got into the house and he was in another room and he heard what happened he heard me speaking in other tongues and he heard the bang noise and he was so worried and he came and he knocked on my door and that's when I realized that someone was in the house and then and then he opened you know he opened the door and he's like are you okay are you okay you know he was getting ready to call 911 because he was so concerned that something had happened that I had sustained an injury he was so concerned about me but that day I began to speak in tongues uh, for the second time it was like the Holy Spirit reactivated the gift and I was you know I was I'm, I'm telling you I was exposed to amazing things amazing I had amazing encounters with God after that day I had angelic visitations God opened my eyes as a child I had incredible incredible encounters that I actually wrote at one of my books if you go to um, my website and if you read my book boy preacher the the first chapter of that book is my encounter with God when I was 11 and how God you know took me to heaven and showed me some amazing things it was an incredible vision I had where I was knocked out for an hour I was on the ground and I was seeing all these things while I was on the ground praying the Lord showed me amazing things so I encourage you to to read that chapter if you if, if you have time and let me tell you something the disciples they were not only teachable but they were open to have fellowship they were open to come together to walk in unity they were open and this is, this is what it says in verse 42. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. See, when the second key when you are filled with the Holy Spirit is you are open to have fellowship, to come together, to pray. You are open to open your heart and embrace others. And pray for others. See, that's one of the giftings of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God gives you charisma. And charisma makes you charismatic. And that's why during the uh, charismatic movement, you know, back in the days in the 80s and 90s, when uh, many Catholics experienced the presence of God, in fact, many, many thousands of Catholics were baptized with the Holy Spirit. I actually preached in many charismatic services in Costa Rica. I was invited by charismatic priests and charismatic leaders to preach in their services. And it was like just like another Pentecostal service. It was fine. It was amazing to see all these Catholics, you know, jumping and speaking in other tongues and, you know, shaking under the power of God. Because when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you have all these different expressions and manifestations that happen and you're not really this is not you know your mind or your heart saying oh, I'm gonna do this or this is not your own doing this is the, the, the doing this is the work of God this is the doing of the Holy Spirit God is doing something in you and when you're exposed to that kind of glory that kind of presence when the Chekinah glory of God fills your room you're no longer in control of your of your emotions it's like the Holy Spirit takes over and then that's why a lot of people you know they, they laugh or they cry or they shake or you know they express uh, the power of God in different ways 
And I know some of you may have your own theory like, oh, no, well, the prophet is subject to the Holy Spirit, to the spirit of the prophet. And look, I understand that. And I know that there is a difference between, uh, you know, uh, walking and, and expressing the power of God and being filled with the Holy Spirit and having a real genuine encounter with God versus being showy. Versus, you know, having just a, a time with uh, with the flesh where you are showing off, where you are, uh, you know, using, uh, uh, replacing what is holy, what is sacred, what is meant to build you up with something that comes from the flesh. Something that is, uh, you know, obviously that's not really coming from the Lord. And, and, and you, you know, if you all have, if you have discernment, if you have discernment, you're going to be able to discern, you're going to be able to draw the line and you're going to be able to discern what is coming from God and what's coming from the flesh. You will be able to discern what is a, a Holy Spirit led manifestation and what is a, a, a flesh driven manifestation or what is something led by your own emotions. You'll be able to discern and so the enemy will not have uh, much room to wiggle in because when you are filled with the Holy Spirit even your flesh comes into submission. Even your flesh comes in agreement because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit he takes over he takes over and that's the beauty of being filled with the Holy Spirit that you hand over the keys that you hand over the wheel that you step out of the wheel and you're like God come on take over take me do whatever you want I'm yours that's what we are meant to do we're meant to hand over we're meant to surrender we're meant to surrender our worries, our fears. We're meant to come into the presence of God. And I can tell you one thing, when you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you may come into that, into that place, you know, feeling overwhelmed and worried and weary and tired. But if you come into the presence of God and you have an encounter with God, it only takes one encounter for you to feel absolutely, completely different. It only takes one encounter. It only takes one touch. It only takes one minute with Jesus for all the burdens and all the weight and all the stuff and all the worry and the anxiety to lift off your shoulders, to be lifted so that you can experience this amazing, incredible peace of God. 